What's up, everybody? Jensen Cummings here. Thank you for tuning in. A new week, Monday morning. I'm very excited to have the legend, Ileana de la Vega, who's the chef owner of El Naranjo in Austin, Texas, as well as Mexican culinary traditions. Thank you so much for taking some time. Thank you, Jensen, for having me. Yes, I was very interested in an article that I just read about uh, in Statesman, give them a shout out, about uh, Governor Abbott's announcement of restaurants reopening. So we're going to go a little bit backwards. Usually we always start with why and who and then get into what and how, but I want to start with kind of the practical moment that we're in right now. Correct. And then let's get into kind of the view of the future when it comes to why you do what you do. So maybe just let us know kind of what's happening in Texas right now and you know, where your position is as far as restaurants reopening kind of May 1st was the call to action. Yeah. Okay. That announcement was made last Monday, actually. And it was yep. set up and open by Friday uh, on 25%, which, uh, you know, economically, it don't make any sense. Nope. And four days to open, that was, again, nothing happened. No, it couldn't happen. You know, you have to put the, the people, you have to train them how to work, et cetera, et cetera. And then, I mean, health concerns mostly. Um, I don't think it's safe yet. Um, we need to wait. I mean, they open it, a, a few restaurants open. And not, I don't think too many, at least not in Austin that I know and I'm aware, uh, but a few open, like the doors to use, you know, use their 25%. Yeah. Now, I heard that they haven't been very busy, but obviously, I mean, you can't make a, a, any profit, not even to pay the rent or pay the, the employer, the employees or anyone with uh, having your capacity limited to 25%. Um, so economically, it doesn't make any sense uh, how many people you need to have. And, you know, you're not supporting them at all, you know. no. Yeah. And so you can't even get into the conversation of what are the sanitation protocols and how do you manage that? What's your menu like? Because the math does not make any sense at 25 percent. Right. Right. So you said in there at 50 percent, you might consider it. Have yeah. you all run the numbers and said, all right, at 50 percent? Percent yeah, we can at least even. We can have the people, you know, busy. And uh, yeah. also we had the PPP program. We applied. We are getting it, so we can pay some, of it, you know, some of the costs for that to to do it. Uh, we're also not not only thinking on, you know, making a smaller menu uh, for right. dining in, but also have a takeout menu uh, for the people that still don't want to go out. And I understand that clearly. I mean, it will be complicated for everybody to be dining with uh, so many restrictions that we have now. Again, we want to go back to work, but yeah. it's not in the safer way that we can imagine, you know, taking care of our, our servers, taking care of the customers, everybody, I mean, ourselves as well. So it's not an easy decision to be close or to open. <laughs> Neither one, you know, it's like it's yeah. every day, you know, we, we don't sleep well since uh, we know that we can open and it's not safe yet to open. Yeah, there is no good decision. There's just the least less bad decision, which is a really hard decision to make. Right. I was really struck by one of the statements where you said, if it was at 50 percent, you might consider it. And then very specifically said with the consent of, of your staff, of your team. Oh, yeah. Is that because you want them to feel safe and secure and motivated to actually get back to work in this way? Yeah, and I don't want to force anyone to risk their, their health for being for work. You know, um, that is it's, it's also tough because you need you know they need the money. But I mean, when we closed um, in 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 March, in sorry, <laughs> in March, I don't even know when. Uh, when we closed in March, we thought, okay, let's do takeout. We talked to the to the staff, and they say no. So no. I, we need them and we want to be with them whenever they need us. I mean, it's like a family. It's a small restaurant, so it's a family for you. So you have to work together with them and try to, to do the best you can for, for them. Maybe some they want it, but it was too risky anyway. I think, um, I think it's a very difficult moment for making a decision. And I think the, the one we did was the right one to close completely. Did you, have you been checking in with your staff throughout and have you actually run this scenario by them as yes. it stands right now? We are thinking, okay, let's, let's do, um, val let's reevaluate what happened through this, you know, this 14 days or 15 days in, you know, yeah. the, the beginning of May and make a resolution maybe to open at the end of May, beginning of June. But we yeah. have to have a consensus for, with them too. 
And so when, when you're talking to your staff and they're thinking about how they're interacting, I know the conversations, it's almost, you know, you see memes everywhere of people in dining rooms with masks on. How do, how do you eat a tamal when you have a mask on? It, what are those conversations like? Are you starting to have the conversations of how you would actually produce your food and, and execute your service? Uh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be very, very tough to, to do it. I think, you know, the people that are in, in more risk because, you know, you're a diner, you know, you're sick or not sick or whatever, and uh, you're sitting there, you're eating. But the servers are the ones who take the plates and then they interact with you. Even they have a face mask and everything. They still get closer to whatever you have in your plate, you know, like getting into the, you know, sitting it in the table and then take it back to the dishwasher station. So, yeah, that is going to be difficult. But, uh, yeah, there are, some, you know, some thoughts on 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 what to do. But a lot of people I know, they are eager to go out. You know, they're really needing to go out. I mean, so we have to. Yeah, we have they've, been, they've been stuck at home. They've been missing the food and maybe more than the food, the, the human interaction. It's something we talk about on almost every single episode is it's doubly hard for the hospitality industry because we're so fueled and built on human interaction or being shoulder to shoulder in the kitchen. Right. So the fact that you're so disconnected from that and being out of work, I mean, you see the numbers potentially up to 25% of people applying for unemployment or on unemployment in the hospitality industry. Right. Yeah. You know, and yet PPP, maybe 9% of the money has gone towards those businesses. So a lot of compounding issues at hand. And so now, now the why. I want to get into the why, and I want to start with opening the restaurant back up. Your whole philosophy, your whole brand, your whole mission, everything you've messaged for years and years and years has really been focused on representing Oaxaca City, representing Mexico, bringing right. that culinary tradition and heritage here to the States. And so when you think about that, what is it the day that you do open in the capacity, in the way that you feel safe, secure, and doing that the right way? What is in that moment that you want to like represent to people? The people that first walk through that door, how do you then deliver that message again to them in this trying time? Well, you know, Mexico has been always a very friendly place. You know, it is, we're very friendly in Mexico. We love people and we want to get together and things like that. So have them be welcome as they, they will be in their home in, in, in the same way. I mean, there is no place safer than you think than home. So having the restaurant feeling, like have the feel that uh, it is like your home, you're eating from your home, we have to be very careful. You know, Mexican food is always, uh, you know, the comfort food for many, for many Americans. And uh, yeah, I mean, it feels good, you know, for some people having a taco or having this Mexican or whatever, you know, you name it, you know, uh, guacamole or whatever it is. Um, so it's, it's, it's that, you know, that's what we are aiming to do, you know, keep the people, the field that is they are eating in their home and they can be safely eating in there with us. Yes. And, and with that, Mexican food, to your point, is as American as pizza and Chinese food, which it's, I know it's funny that those things are not American, yet they are as American as those items now. Yet also the food that you have been really championing is different than what a lot of people associate with Mexican food Correct. or the, the Tex-Mex style. And, and there's great Mexican food in Texas to say Tex-Mex is a disservice to Mex and Tex. So I understand that <laughs> yeah, for you, when you're trying to deliver on that, it is hospitality in Mexico it is so, so welcoming. They really, Abuelita puts you on her lap and feeds you tamales. Like it's an important part of the culture. So speak to that and maybe more specifically the food items that represent that feeling of family to you. Which ones they will be? I mean, we are, I mean, we, we specialize in making moles, for example, and salsas and things like that. So we will, we will keep doing what we have been doing, maybe reducing the menu. So don't have too many, op or, you know, many items on it, uh, okay. but we'll do the same things that we have always do. Um, and also having a different menu for takeout that is easy for them to to take. I mean, sometimes the the food. I'm not. I'm not a. We are not a takeout people. You know, we don't do takeout because we think that the the half of the food is is you know like the flavors and everything. The freshness of it sure. is destroyed when you do takeout. So we have to be very smart that you know, we compromise what we do. Um, uh, doing takeout. So. 
it has to be something visible. Yeah, I understand. So the so the specific food items for you, the the moles, the seven moles of Oaxaca, like really represent that. When you're talking to somebody, one of your guests or a, a brand new cook that maybe has their preconceived notions of Mexican food, and you want to introduce them to very specifically your region or kind of the broader Mexican food, because I mean Mexico, Mexico and China, the most diverse food cultures on the entire planet. So to boil it down to kind of this homogenized, Americanized food stresses the potential that it has in its variety. For you, what are those first conversations when you're trying to introduce somebody to mole, to new ingredients, new techniques, new flavors? Well, what we have been trying, I mean, we've been told many times by, by, by customers that arrive and it's like, okay, this doesn't look Mexican. Right. Like, okay, well, you know, there's a, another regional food of Mexico is the Tex-Mex, of course. You know, right. using basically the ingredient you have available and you do it. But this is different. And I mean, just suggesting them to try some of the things that they are not as complicated maybe as a mole. Or some people say, like, I hate mole because they haven't tried a good one either. So it's a slow, it has been a steady one for four years. You know, we had a restaurant in Mexico, in Oaxaca first. Then we came to the States. We opened our first location, and then this is the second location. We closed the previous one here, too. And so this is the only one we have right now in Austin. And um, so it's always has been the situation for that, trying to keep up with it. Explaining in a good way. I mean, they may like it, they may not. And I'm not yeah. judging if Tex-Mex is good. Or if you like it, that's good. You know, it's good for you. That's fine. So we're not judging here. We're trying just to showcase something different. Uh, but we have easy tasting flavors in the menu. So it's, it's, a, it's a very well, I think, well thought menu that we have a little bit of and comprise a little bit of everything there. I love it. When you think about the food that you're producing, who is it that you're channeling? Who, who that you grew up with in Oaxaca, your family, uh, early chef mentors, any of those people, who are those people that you're channeling and trying to bring their passion for that food to the forefront? Uh, I mean, there's, I mean, everybody in Mexico is very excited about our food. So, I mean, my mother, people that I have read books, you know, from ages, you know, cookbooks, you know, they, they, it's, it's just there, especially somebody, I don't think so. I have been taking all my inspiration from actually from the markets and the people, and, you know, some very, very old cookbooks uh, from Mexico. So that's, that's it. Yeah, I like it. The, uh, speak on the markets a little bit. Uh, when you are thinking about, and I, I know your brand is really about the Mexican heritage, the culture, that region, and then also being very embedded in the culture of Austin, Texas. And I know that's really important to you there. So reflect on that. You go to the market there. You're working with local farmers. What does that look like? The ingredients that you can get in Texas that for you really represent Mexico really well. I mean, we can um, we can make we have been hearing me well. Yeah, hold on. I was just about to say it sounded a little echoey. Hold on, I'm gonna disappear for a second. We'll start again. It's just like a reset, like we're on in life right now. It feels hard for the course. So. Perfect. Okay, so we work here with the farm table. We we work here with uh, you know several local local people. And but sometimes we need to bring things out, you know, from uh, from the from from Mexico actually. So corn comes from Mexico for us. The beans come from Mexico, and we try to incorporate uh, the vegetables here are very different than normally the vegetables. Or there is not a seasonal vegetable in Mexico. You know, we have tomatoes all year round. We have right. all year round. So we, I mean, we can buy them here when they're in season, but we have to import them when they're from, you know, when they are not in season to keep working. But uh, I guess we have a good balance. Our meats are from te from Texas mostly and, you know, those kind of things. So we, we balance a little bit to help everybody that we can on the way. And have you actually, kind of getting back to just the practical nature of what's going to happen next, have you been uh, in talks with some of your suppliers and are you going to be able to get the products that you expect to be able to get coming out yeah, of this? Yeah, still, still, I think I'm gonna get the, the same products. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's, so, that's good so. to hear. All right, I wanna get back to your people yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Talk about them a little bit. So it's a family. 
Sometimes it's a very dysfunctional family, but it is a family in the restaurant industry for sure. And so who are the people that you that you work with that you're kind of most inspired by? And I'm just always fascinated. We call them unsung hospitality heroes. I always want to hear about the people that you are so lucky to work with day in and day out and what it means to you to be able to get back to work with them. Um, I mean, we have uh, we have trained a few people. You know, my my chef de cuisine is awesome. I love him. It's Brian. And we love him. It's always trying to make things better, finding ways to, to do the things. So I love his enthusiasm, his knowledge, and, and everything else. And he's also always been eager to learn more about Mexican cooking. Um, so that is one of the my favorite persons. Uh, but everybody, I mean, even the everyone, in, in, it's, it's so important in the restaurant. You think of the dishwashers. You cannot live without them. So that's very important. So everyone is, you know, it's a, it has to be a very oil, well-oiled machine uh, that works from the the very passionate um, hostess that we have, hostesses that we have, our front of the man, of the house manager, yeah. Austin is also awesome. And they're always finding ways to do better, you know, training better and teach the, the staff better things on new techniques or whatever it is. So it's it just, it's, it's a wonderful world, you know, the, the kitchen and the restaurant business. It's like it great. Is. I just want to spend all day talking about them. In this moment, everything is so trying. It's so challenging. Is your business going to survive? Do you do curbside not? What's 25% occupancy look like? Are my servers wearing masks? How do we set tables? Like all of these things are so challenging. Yeah. Yet I can just yeah. see the look on your face when you get to talk about somebody like Brian. It's just so meaningful to us because they really, really matter. And so I'm fascinated with that. When you think about uh, them again, and opening back up the restaurants, are you going to be able to, if you're at potentially 50% occupancy, hire your full staff back? Or what does that look like? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, some people can, can dedicate themselves to take out, for example, okay. on the front of the house. Uh, we have a very small kitchen and we have not too many people on the staff on the back, you know, back of the house. So we believe we can do that. You know, maybe some okay. shifts on the front of the house they won't be maybe all the shifts that they used to get, but yeah. as well, they can get, you know, they can make some money. And we are hopeful that our patrons will understand that and keep them better, for example. <laughs> yeah, and I was very interested in that. In, in this show, only a couple of times it's come up and I'm, I'm always really wanting everybody to get their acknowledgement. And quite a few people said, people are tipping unbelievable amounts when they are doing pickup because they're trying to support. Yes, absolutely. So. You also are unsung hospitality heroes if you are tipping well and above to support those people. So I definitely want to give them a uh, shout out as well. And so let's get right into them. Your guests, the ones that we call them regulars that are in your restaurants on a weekly, daily basis, and also the greater Austin and then anybody looking to travel this area. You know, what do you want to say to them when when you want to reassure them that you are going to be able to deliver the food and the experience and now the safety and transparency of your process. So what are you saying to those those guests? Well, essentially, the most important thing, I guess, is to transmit the message that we won't open until we are sure that we can open for every reason, you know, economically and also safety, which is the most important thing. If not, we're not going to open, believe me. Um, no. <laughs> so I guess that's the most important. We will continue. I mean, if we open, we will know that we can deliver a good product on the food, you know, wise, and also be safe in a place that you can enjoy your visit there. And also safety for us, you know, it's, it has to make sense in every way and, and make it. So we're like one step at a, at a time, I guess, you know, like every day thinking yeah. on ways to make it better or make it happen. So <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I know, I know. It's like, you can't give me a, an answer and I, because there is no answer. There's just more questions, yeah. right? And so I, I appreciate that. What I'm always looking for for my guests is to understand where your thinking process is because I think for a business owner, for your staff, for your guests, your potential guests, knowing where your head's at is probably the most important thing because if they can trust the way you're going about it, then the actions that you actually ultimately take, they'll have trust and confidence in. So I can appreciate that. Let's look way back. 
before all this crazy shit started happening, right? And you guys are just crushing it. You're doing your thing. You're representing Oaxaca, Mexico so well. You're representing us in Texas. You're representing your restaurants. And what in that do you miss the most? Um, I guess interaction. That is the most. And when the people like the food and they do something about it, that's that's always my job. I guess that's I guess. the thing I, I, you know, I miss the most, you know, cooking and all that, but also, you know, like when the people understand what you're doing and they like to come back for more, that's the most important thing for me. Yeah. And how have you been able to, to understand that when somebody comes in first time, has an experience, are they having the kind of spirits that you're looking for for them in that? Has that been clear when you've delivered upon that mission? Uh, I think so. I mean, most of the people, like, they, they say, like, first, I've never had this before or something like that. And, uh, you know, we love it. We really like what you're, you're doing. And they you see them coming back. You know, that, that is the best thing you can get us a reward, you know, like, it's not, it's not the money, it's the, the feeling that what you're doing, we understand it and appreciate it. Yeah, before the money, you'd be doing something completely different. That's, that's for sure. And so, all right, so I want to touch on one thing. This is just serendipity, which was really great. Uh, tomorrow's guest is Jesse Torres, who right. is a barman of American Elm here in Denver. Had no idea there was any connection between the two of you. And this is just so, so great about the hospitality industry. It's so tight knit. There's so many overlapping storylines. And so Jesse reached out right away and said, I cannot believe you're having Liliana Della Vega on your show. She was my instructor when I was at the Culinary Institute of America. So I don't know if I have a question, but just touch on that. The fact that one of your former students is on a show the day after you are, and there's just that, that connection. Always, always in the food business, you know, you go somewhere and it's like, oh, I, I knew you from that, or you know each other for, you know, like, a, I don't know, a conference that I attended sometime, or I was presenting, and somebody, you know, either a colleague or, a, or people that they were just attending the conference. Um, or, I mean, the, the, other, the other thing is, uh, you know, when we were in Oaxaca, I was also teaching cooking classes there and had the restaurant, and years later, people come, it's like, I had your, you know, it was in your restaurant. I took your cooking class. There is one lady right now making all this Mexican food, and she brought out, you know, like my my, notes, you know, on a paper, still with her notes and everything, and she put it up on Facebook. So you know, all the people that you know throughout your life through this business, because you met a lot of people, obviously because it's hospitality, right? Uh, a lot of people also from the Culinary Institute of America when I was, you know, the coordinator for the. Mexican studies and Latin American studies there. And uh, like this example. It's great. And so just know the impact that you've had on one individual person like Jesse in this moment, or the seeing the notes on the, the page that you've given him, them that it matters. Like it really, really matters to people because the potential for that to change their trajectory cannot be understated. Do you, do you feel the, the joy, the weight, and the responsibility of that as kind of a leader in your field? Well, I mean, when we left Mexico, uh, we always thought, you know, okay, if we are in the United States, if we open a restaurant, it's going to be a Mexican restaurant again, because that's what we know. Um, we have to be sure that what we're doing is what, you know, Mexico feel proud of, it, you know. So that is, I guess, uh, what has been driving us for, for, you know, for a long time. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate it. And just knowing, having watched your work over the years from a distance and being always intrigued and interested and inspired by it and having grown up in Southern California, spent a lot of time in Mexico, a lot of time not doing what I was supposed to do in Mexico, but still a lot of time in Mexico. And, uh, and to your point, just the people there are so inviting. I mean, I've sat on little plastic neon red chairs near the beach in Rosarita and somebody's out fishing and then grandma Abuelita is cooking. There's, there's very few things like that uh, in the United States. And so anytime there is something like that in the United States, I gravitate towards it. And then having that culture brought here in a thoughtful way and not having to dumb it down for the Americans. 
has yeah, been really important. And has that been challenging for you to hold steadfast to um, really treat? I guess, you know, honestly speaking, I get ingredients, you know, very good Mexican ingredients, you know, from either the, we import it or it's what we get as a produce, you know, produce here. So, so not on that way, um, I have been always going to be true to myself. This is what I do, this is what I keep doing. I can't change it. Uh, we were tempted, no, really. I have a very dear friend of mine that when we opened the first location here in Austin, he said, I give you two months to you have chips and salsa. Ah. And I was like, okay, you better give me a little bit more because still, unless I'm not doing chips and salsa. Uh, it's, a chips and salsa. Uh, it's a great idea. It's not Mexican, so it doesn't represent me. So why to put it? It's a great idea. I, mean, I have no problem with it, you know, honestly, but it's not, it's not Mexican. So we just have to be what we are. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Well, keep doing what you're doing because Thank it's you. and let's. And, well, first, I'll give you a moment. Any last thoughts that you maybe have about your situation or your hopes for what happens? And then we always end with some playlist items because I definitely want to hear a couple things that maybe help you relax in this yes. time. Awesome. Any last thoughts that you maybe have about anything you want to share with people before we uh, wrap up? Yeah, uh, no, just stay safe, you know, try to do the right things uh, every day, you know, give yourself at home and do the right things so this will be over sooner than later. Yeah, I could not agree more. So I, I appreciate the sentiment and I appreciate you also putting yourself out there and, and letting your thoughts be known. I think it's important. I'm sure you've gotten lots of praise and seen animosity because of a statement like that, statements like that. So. I appreciate it, but it's important. If you're going to be a leader in this industry, you have to lead from the front and lead by example. So I appreciate that. All right, what are a couple items, maybe songs or books or TV shows or movies, anything that right now is bringing you just a couple moments of... <sighs> well, uh, we see movies, for example. You know, we, we went back to all the collection of 007, for example. You know, you know, we're doing the doing the Medici's, you know, it's anything that you don't have to think much. I, can, I mean, we're readers, my husband and I were, you know, very strong readers. We have read all the time and very complicated things and very easy things by now. Basically, we're on the, on the easy side. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, mystery books or you name it, you know, something easy to read that you don't, you don't care, you don't have to think about because our brains are too tired. <laughs> Thinking on the yeah. <laughs> the moment you need to decompress a little bit. I think that's uh, I think that's important. You have plenty of anxiety and and uh, hard decisions being made daily to try and figure out how to survive all this and how to thrive coming out of it. So I definitely appreciate the opportunity to turn the brain off for just a little bit. It makes all the difference in the world. Liliana de la Vega, thank you so much, not only for this conversation, which was, you know, a, a great way for me to start my week, so I appreciate it personally, but also for the leadership, because I think it's important, I think we need it, I think we need voices, strong voices from every angle, thoughtful voices, most of all, and so I cannot wait until you reopen, because I know you'll be doing it the right way, and I really cannot wait until I get to come back down to Austin, Texas, one of my favorite food cities anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. Unbelievable food scene down there, music scene down there, craft beer scene down there. So I'm excited to get back down there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Sorry for that. Sorry. Next call. Next call. You got stuff to do. I appreciate you. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye bye. And some thanks. That was awesome. Liliana de la Vega uh, have followed what she's done for a lot of years and always knew that she had the chops when it came to cooking, always knew that she was a leader when it came to representing Mexico, their culinary traditions. It was really nice to see that she's really taking a leadership role and having a voice in the industry. In this moment, in every moment, I think to come, we need those thoughtful, those creative voices to kind of lead the way. So appreciate that. Appreciate this conversation and uh, very interested. Have a lot of uh, viewers, listeners, contemporaries down in Texas. So I've been connecting with some of them, finding out what's happening, where their heads are at. And so it will continue to evolve. I think 
learning from a lot of the connections that we have down in Georgia, specifically Atlanta mostly, and then down in Texas as a few of the states that are kind of getting the ball rolling with reopening first and uh, hope we can glean some good practices and hope not too many bad practices, but it's inevitable that we'll see some of both. So there is that. Tomorrow's show, I already mentioned it, Jesse Torres uh, runs the bar at American Elm in Denver, Colorado. He's going to be on the show, former student of Ileana de la Vega. I love how that just happened to work out that they were on in back-to-back days. So we'll check in with him a little bit, see what's happening in his world, and maybe talk cocktails a little bit. All right, everybody. Appreciate you as always. 